Let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 6. So thankful for you being here this morning. So thankful for you joining us online. As we begin a very... important, provocative, rich study this month in what is called the Sermon on the Plain in Luke 6, verses 20 and following. Last week, we saw in chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, that as Jesus began his ministry in the region of Galilee, crowds started to come from as far south as Jerusalem and as far north as Tyre and Sidon, which in that point in time was the region of of Syria. And we mentioned that in verse 18, Luke mentions first that they came to hear him. Now, whether that was their highest priority or not, we don't really know, but it, 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 it draws our attention to the fact that crowds were listening. They were paying attention that what Jesus was saying was different than what they were hearing all the other voices around them, religiously, philosophically, and, and, and what have you. But to be sure, they also came because, as he said at the end of what we looked at last week in verse 19, power was literally just exuding itself out of the person of Jesus. The result, more and more crowds, bigger and bigger crowds. Crowds became multitudes. But that's not where it ended. There was something deeper going on than just a bigger collection of folks. Something was beginning to stir in the hearts and the minds of listeners. Not all. But we trust a significant number of them. And maybe their, their spokesman, the crowd's spokesman, was a man named Nicodemus. A Jewish leader himself. A Pharisee. But one who, as he was taking in all that he saw and heard of Jesus, came to Jesus. Remember in John chapter 3, at night, perhaps so he's not rec- recognized. We don't know that for sure. But he comes to him and says this in John 3, verse 2, Rabbi, meaning teacher, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. He's getting close, isn't he? Since Jesus could do the things he did, it made sense, at least in Nicodemus' mind, that he should listen to the things he said. And the things he said were every bit as powerful as the things he did. So you had this this beautiful symmetry of what Jesus was doing as power came from him and he healed diseases and cast out demons as well as power in his words. And one of those examples is Luke chapter 6. You can sit next to your wife if you'd like. She's just right there, Zach. I mean, I hate to see that. And she looked at you like. We can talk later if there's some issue. <laughs> it's funny what you see up here. You kind of get, I, I get it all. I see it all. One example of this amazing symmetry between Jesus' credibility in what he did, giving birth to people listening to what he said, is, is what's called the Sermon on the Plain in Luke chapter 6. Now, this is what I'm going to say about this. We're going to read this, and you're going to start to say, this sounds familiar. I've, I've heard this before. Yes, in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Again, the debate, are these two different sermons? It, it, it just doesn't really matter. Is this a second version of the same sermon? Jesus taught for a, a period of time, and he taught in different places, and it stands to reason that he had pretty good material. And so he probably shared it on more, more than one occasion, 
And uh, whether this is a separate occasion or a second version of the Sermon on the Mount, it just doesn't make any difference. It's all true. But this is what I want you to keep in mind. As we delve into this sermon for the month of August, remember this. These are the words of the incarnate God. This sermon is not just words from a good teacher. This sermon is not just words by an inspired preacher. These are the words of God in flesh. It's little wonder then that that more than one preacher and commentator have called Luke 6, 20 through 49, the Christian manifesto. A manifesto being, of course, a public declaration of of objectives by a sovereign ruler, in this case, the creator of the universe. And as such, because these are the words of God, a public declaration of His objectives from His rule, it should come as no surprise to us that what God says about how one expresses faith will look very different than what the crowds thought. It's it's different probably than what we think today are genuine expressions of faith. Here's what I mean. I heard growing up and still hear today, some take these words of Jesus, especially the Beatitudes, as prerequisites for entering the kingdom of God. That's how it was presented to me in my youth, that one must become poor in spirit, one must be hungry and thirsty for righteousness, that they must mourn for their sins, and so on and so on. The problem with that is, who measures that? How poor is poor in your spirit? How hungry and thirsty are you supposed to be? How, how meek is meek? But the thought was that unless you were, or until you were these things, only then were you worthy of entering God's kingdom. In other words, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount or Sermon on the Plain have been understood and applied as some kind of New Testament version of the Ten Commandments. Following Jesus' teaching is is what you do to gain entry into the kingdom instead of Jesus revealing what life looks like in the kingdom, which is what it is. And so Martin Luther said this, Christ is saying nothing in this sermon about how we become Christians, but only about the works and fruit that no one can do unless he is a Christian and in a state of grace. So let's get that clear in our minds right now, that everything we're going to look at in the month of August is not a prerequisite for entering the kingdom. It is a description of those who, in a state of grace, have entered into the kingdom. So a question needs to be asked, a spiritual Q&A, if you will. What are the followers of Jesus supposed to look like? If this is a description description of those in the kingdom, it stands to reason that the question is, what do followers of Jesus look like? What are the characteristics of a genuine disciple? The question is not, what must I do to be saved, but what does it look like to be saved? And for those of faith in the room this morning, that's the critical question. And the answer, in one word, is different. Different. In every way imaginable. Different. What Jesus is going to teach in this sermon concerns how different his disciples are from the world. And a warning. It's more than what you might first think. Now to be sure, God has always demanded and expected His people 
to live differently from the world as far as the outside appearances are concerned. So look at a, a, a very clear and concise summation of this in the Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 18. Not a passage you probably turn to often, but read with me verses 1 through 5. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. So clearly God is saying that we are to live differently, at least on the outside. We, we don't follow rules and statutes and, and philosophies of pagan societies. We follow the rules, the laws, the statutes of the one true God. In the New Testament, Paul kind of picks up on that same notion, that same idea, in most of his letters, but very clearly in the letter of Ephesians, when he te- where he tells us to walk or live in a manner worthy of our calling, to put away lying, stealing, corrupt language, sexual immorality, and other things. So there is a case that being different means doing different, living differently on the outside, externally. But it doesn't end there, and in fact, it doesn't even start there. And here's what I mean. Jesus would tell a group of Jewish leaders in Mark chapter 10, Pharisees again, and he's going to quote to them from the, from the prophet Isaiah, which tells us how long what Jesus is going to address has, has been an issue. If it was spoken hundreds of years before, it's still a problem. Jesus will say this to these Jewish leaders. You honor me with your lips. You perform the externals. You say the prayers. You sing the songs. What's the problem? Remember? But your hearts are far from me. On another occasion, Jesus called such people whitewashed tombs, clean on the outside, inside, full of bones and uncleanness. So for some, for some, religion ends up kind of, it's kind of like those people who, and if you're one of these I don't mean to offend, but it's these people who dress up their dogs in clothes, right? And they parade them, and they take pictures of them, and they post them. But underneath the clothes, what do you have? you got a dog. It's still a dog. Because you can't can't make a dog anything other than a dog. But in the gospel of grace... The gospel has the power to transform an individual. Not just reform, not just tweak, but transform. Not just dress up. Because if all we do is dress up our lives with external practices, if that's all we do, eventually our true nature will come out. When pressure When certain certain circumstances come along, our true nature will always come out if all we've done is shown a different external. So, the first K-State football game I ever went to, my son and future daughter-in-law were attending K-State, but my son, Matthew, was, is, always will be a Jayhawk fan. So, he and I... And, and we went to the, the K-State football game wearing purple because our only tickets were in the student section. So I wore the purple. But you know what happened when a pressure situation came up. It kind of came up 
that I, I cheered for the Jayhawks. And it wasn't good. Now, the Jayhawks lost, so everyone was fine. They had pity or they, you know. But my true nature came out. It didn't matter what I looked like on the outside. So Jesus goes on to tell those Jews who are focused on externals, and he's telling us that if all we think about is being different is on the outside, know this, that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth will speak. And things that come out of a person reveal what's in a person. So We may be doing different things, but if our hearts are as dark as the people around us, they are not impressed. There's no, there is no difference, no matter what it looks like on the outside. So what we're going to read in the Sermon on the Plain is that God's values are totally and completely upside down from the world and that they are worked from the inside out in his children. Which makes every word of this sermon that we're going to look at in the month of August radical, convicting, and I hope deeply motivating. But know this, I, I, I have to agree with my best friend Alistair Begg when he said, Approaching this text, I feel myself at the edge of the ocean, having only dipped my toes, but never having gone deeper than my ankles. There's a dimension of spiritual depth we all need to wrestle with in Jesus' sermon. Because to the extent that as God's people, we're ready to take seriously these standards and these values and to display them as we live our lives, then and only then will we offer to the world an alternative society. Only then will we make a true difference. But he didn't end there. He went on to say this. From his perspective, he said, the only thing we have, and he's generalizing the American church and admitted as much, the only thing we have really been offering the past 25 years is an attempt to overturn the political structures for the well-being of some right-wing cause. And any honest person has to admit that it hasn't worked. And every indication is it's not about to work. And we ought not be surprised because it's not the mandate of Christ. And he said those words in 1999. Now he's not saying to avoid involvement in politics and neither am I. We may want change. And, and there can be a difference of opinion on the extent and the content of that change. But in the process of wanting change to our culture, even Christians must go about it differently. Different. So when a candidate in the upcoming primary touts himself as a Christian in one ad and then in another ad says that he hates Hillary and can't stand Pelosi it's not any different than the way the world does politics no difference it's name-calling now by the way it can be done differently Some of us in this room know Karen Brownlee, and she did things differently when she was a state senator in Kansas. Some of us know Mark Dupree. He's done it differently as the district attorney in Wyandotte County. It can be done differently. I think it's time, and I think Jesus is telling us, 
that the church must come to understand that the most incriminating statement you can make against a Christian are the words, you're no different than anyone else. We may hold different beliefs and even different practices, but if we conduct our lives in the same manner as the world, our testimony falls on deaf ears. What Jesus teaches is different, completely upside down from the world's values, which is why in his book on the Sermon on the Mount, John Stott calls it Christian counterculture. Or why Daryl Johnson, a professor and preacher that I took a class with at Regent College years ago called these sermons gospelized humanity. That's a great description. To illustrate just how upside down the kingdom values are, I want you to ask yourself this. Which would you rather be? Poor, hungry, sad, and hated? Or rich, well-fed, happy, and popular? You know where I'm going with that, don't you? Let's turn now to Luke 6, beginning with verse 20. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor. For yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you've received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Let's pray. As we turn not only our eyes, but our ears to you, Jesus, would your spirit soften our stance? that we may hear clearly, accurately the words you have for those who come to faith in you. Would these words be the description of our lives on this earth? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let me share what I see as four upside-down truths of the kingdom. Luke records four Beatitudes. The Sermon on the Mount has eight, but again, we've already discussed, I think, a second version of the same sermon. So, four upside-down truths of the kingdom. Number one, recognizing our depravity is what leads to salvation. Recognizing our depravity is what leads to salvation. Ultimately, church, in the end, a person does not live any differently until they have come to grips with their spiritual depravity. There may be short-lived excitement about heaven, But genuine, long-term life change from the inside out does not happen until a person recognizes they brought nothing to Jesus and that they had absolutely nothing to offer for their salvation. And until you and I come to understand this, you will live under the false assumption that you are a pretty good person, better than most, 
And when you do, know this, that the cross is emptied of its power in your heart. Which is why any inclination on our part that we aren't that bad makes a mockery of the cross. So the main reason people have a difficult time living by grace in all their relationships, in every facet of their lives, is that they have not fully understood their need for grace. Jesus says there is blessing in recognizing your poverty. And conversely, he said there, woe is an, uh, an expression of grief to those who are rich. Now, we need to take a second to address what you're probably wondering. There is no inherent blessing in being poor. Otherwise, we would just sell everything right now, become destitute, and then expect, well, now that I'm destitute, I'm bound for, the, I'm bound for heaven. Likewise, there's no inherent curse for being rich. After all, both of those are relative terms, right? If you're thinking, if you're talking financially. Jesus did not offer an economic scale. Well, if you're this poor, or if you're this rich. But there are attitudes that can accompany poverty and wealth. The poor want desperately to believe that there's something better. The rich often try desperately to hold on to what they have, believing that this, is, this life is as good as it gets. But even in these physical circumstances, Jesus is addressing the heart of both the poor and the rich. Poverty of spirit, as, as Matthew records, rich in pride. The rich religiously have all they want with the accolades of people around them. It's not all they need, but it's all they want. And Jesus said, you've received your consolation. But to those who recognize their spiritual depravity, grace becomes their reward. Calvin put it this way, he only who is reduced to nothing in himself and relies on the mercy of God is the one who is poor. And the Christian believer, listen to this, the Christian believer should be the last person in the world to be guilty of snobbery. I love how to the point <laughs> those guys were. Grace is only grace to the poor in spirit. And only the poor in spirit receive citizenship in God's kingdom. That's completely upside down from the world's values. Second upside down truth, understanding our starvation is what leads to contentment. Understanding how starved we are is what actually gets us to the point of being content. Being hungry is to be in a position of need unlike the well-fed, who no matter how wonderful a meal you set before them, they turn it away because they're already full. So at this time, I have to tell a story on my friend Jerry Bowen, and I did not get permission for this. So if you see him, I'll deny it, because he's not in here. But early in his marriage, he would tease his wife, Debbie, about not having dinner ready the moment he got home. And he was teasing, and... I think she knew that he was teasing, as, at least as he tells the story. So, on one occasion, after he and Phil had finished a job, and it was their tradition that when a job was done, last day, complete, he and some of the crew would go out and celebrate by eating barbecue. So they went to K&M in Spring Hill. One afternoon, had the ribs, the brisket, the pulled pork, the sausage, had it all. Came home, and the moment he walked in the door, 
the fried chicken, mashed potatoes, gravy were sitting on the table. Debbie had it waiting for him. He said, it was the best meal I ever hated eating in my life. (laughs) He didn't want it. He forced it on himself because of what he had said earlier. When you fill yourself up, when you fill yourself up, the real feast set before you loses its appeal. So for the well-fed in this life who think they have all they need, the promise is they will, on the day of judgment, find themselves desperately hungry. So I'm wondering, have you reached a point in your life, come to this clarity of thought that you were and are spiritually starving. That you've come to a point where you have accepted and believed there is nothing in this world that can satisfy you. Let me give you an example of someone who tried to fill himself with the things of this world only to discover how unsatisfied he remained. His name is Solomon. And he wrote about his experience in the book of Ecclesiastes. Listen to his account from Ecclesiastes chapter 2. It's a little bit lengthy, so follow along with me. Ecclesiastes 2, 1 through 11. I said in my heart, come now. I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was was vanity. Now that word vanity is a hard word, one of the most difficult words in Hebrew to, to translate. It literally means vapor, but then what does that mean? And I think what Solomon is saying is that it just, there's nothing settled about it. It's just like, the, it's just like the, a vapor, a mist that just blows away. It doesn't last. Verse 2, I said of, I said of laughter. It is mad and of pleasure. What use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses, planted vineyards for myself. I I myself... I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil." And then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was a vapor (laughs) and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. He kept trying to find what is fixed and firm in this life to no avail. There was no peace, there was no contentment, no satisfaction. Despite being full on the outside, his conclusion, chapter 2, verses 24 to 26, there is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him, Who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner he has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to the one who pleases God. 
This also is a vapor, striving after the wind. Jesus declared a blessing on those who understand their starvation. There's nothing in the world that will bring them contentment. Fourth, or third, truth. Embracing our brokenness leads to joy. It's brokenness that leads to joy. I mentioned the story of the rich young ruler last week. Remember the man who came to Jesus, I think out of genuine desire for truth. He falls on his knees before Jesus. Good teacher, he calls him. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus starts with the Ten Commandments. The young man says, I've been, I've been good. I've been keeping those since a youth. Jesus' response after that is another way of teaching what he's teaching the crowds. To this rich young man, he's saying, all right, now there's something deeper. The externals, okay, let's go inside. And he says in Mark chapter 10, verse 21, and Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. And you know what happened? (laughs) The rich young man who comes to Jesus, kind of bouncing a step, smile on his face, leaves Jesus, slumped and sad because he had so many possessions. No contentment, no satisfaction in his life. Woe to you who laugh now in your self-satisfaction, for you shall mourn and weep. Solomon would go on to write these words, Ecclesiastes 5.10, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. No satisfaction there. Two verses later, chapter 5, verse 12, But sweet is the sleep of a laborer, Whether he eats little or much, but the stomach of the rich will not let them sleep. Embracing our brokenness leads to joy. Upside down from the world's standards. Fourth, accepting our disfavor leads to reward. Accepting our disfavor leads to reward. Two more critical questions. Do you want to be popular now and have Jesus in the end say, depart from me, I never knew you? Or do you want to be unpopular now and hear Jesus say in that day, well done, good and faithful servant, enter your rest? Here's what I'm observing these days, and again, I'm generalizing Rather than rejoicing over our disfavor and rather than leaping for joy at being ridiculed, we fire back at our ridiculers with the same arrows and sharp comments. We ridicule the ridiculers. And soon we are excluded and reviled, not on account of our belief in Jesus, but because of our obnoxious attitudes and behavior. Or another extreme, we decry our fate and we mope around wondering what the world is coming to as if the world hasn't always been this way since the fall. Look, Even God's prophets were treated harshly, they were ridiculed, they were berated, they were persecuted, they were even put to death, some of them. If you're treated as they were, Jesus is saying, don't complain. Instead, leap for joy and rejoice. We're called to be different, right? (laughs) So then turn the other cheek, go the extra mile. Now, of course, you can avoid all that and you can blend in or compromise and act as though you belong to the world and everyone will tell you what a great person you are. 
So watch out where your praise comes from and the content of that praise. If you're tempted to compromise and say what you think others will appreciate, agree with, enjoy, then you will be accepted, not hated. You will be included, not excluded. You will be honored, not reviled. You will be complimented, not spurned as one of those intolerant Christians. And if that's the case, you won't offer anything different than the rest of the culture. You'll be praised, but you won't be different. This sermon of Jesus is not a formula for salvation. It's a description of the saved. It's gospelized. It's people who have been saturated with the gospel. And it's the best way to make a difference in this world. It's the only way to make a difference in this world. Father, um, I pray that you would transcend the uh, attempts of a faulty teacher like myself and that your words, your words, your message would sink deep into our hearts. And God, that we would desire to live radically different from the inside out. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.